Hi, my name is Jordan Wilson. Today we're going to move from our look at active management into the passive investing side of things. And as you can guess, a lot of what we said with the active management of assets will be the complete opposite with passive. The first thing that we look at with passive investing is that we want to match the market. And that market could be a broad index like the S&P 500. It could be a global market, the world as a whole. Or it could be a small cap. US small cap equities, high yield bonds. So you can go from global indices all the way down to individual sectors. And I think as we talked in a prior episode, there's more than 3 million indices out there that cover every possible market or sub-market that you can think of. So the issue here is if we want to match the market, if I'm investing in an index fund, I want to make sure I am as close to that market return as possible. And there's sort of three things that can throw you off a little. The first side would be your tracking error. And we talked about that a bit before as well. That's going to be how does the fund replicate the index that it follows? And how they replicate both the system they use and the way they implement it will create tracking error. And one of the things with tracking error that I did mention before is that tracking error can ha happen on both sides. So we tend to worry about if tracking error causes us to underperform the benchmark. For example, if the S&P 500 did 10% and the way we replicated our portfolio only own, earns us 9.5%, then there's a negative 50 basis point tracking error. But the same mistakes in creating that replication can also go the other way at times. We may wake up one year and if the S&P did 10%, we may be at 11%. So we came out ahead, but that's not a function of management or intent. It's just that we did a poor job of trying to perfectly replicate the market index. Now we talked about the three different styles of replication in a previous episode. We have full replication. And that's where every security in the index is held in its appropriate weighting. And most, I would say most indices out there are market weighted. So the S&P 500 has a significant investment in Apple and Microsoft versus very little in the bottom tier. The second style is partial or sampling. And they use statistical models and other means to determine a sample size of the overall benchmark that will recre recreate the performance exactly or as close to exactly as possible. And maybe that means that you are able in the S&P 500, instead of owning all 500 shares, or companies, uh, 
as you would in a full replication, maybe you can figure out a way to only hold 50 or 100. And the performance of those fewer securities will result in exactly the same overall performance as the benchmark. And again, your sampling techniques will dictate how much tracking error that you have because you aren't holding the complete index. And then the third way is synthetically replicating. That's usually the cheapest way and the way that closest mirrors the index. And they use financial instruments like futures, swaps, other derivatives, instead of buying the underlying holdings. You still may have tracking error though with this, even though it's a little bit cheaper and because you're just buying a derivative, you should be able to replicate exactly. But you may find problems in markets that are less established. If I'm trying to replicate the Nairobi Stock Exchange or small cap Chilean funds, yes, I can find an index that represents that, but I may not find a lot of options as far as derivatives to replicate. And the fewer the options that you have, sometimes the higher the cost to implement. So you can have costs there. You may not be able to find a perfect index, even out of the 3 million. And again, if you have to adjust, there's some tracking error. You might also find, especially in less developed markets, that you have counterparty risk. So if I enter into a swap agreement with a second party, their ability to deliver on that contract or not is a risk to me from the other side of the equation. And that's them being a counterparty, that's a risk. Lack of fulfillment of the contract. So still risks and costs associated with synthetics. And I think some people, me at times, I guess, like that underlying holdings. If I buy a diamond or a spider, that will be basically a trust fund that holds all the underlying equities in the Dow Jones 30, the diamonds, or the S&P 500, the spider. So if something goes wrong with the fund holder, I know that a full replication, they can divvy out the assets to the individual investors over time. Can they do the same with a synthetic contract or a partially replicated portfolio? So that's an issue for some people as well. The next cost are the transaction timing costs. Now you're going to have a little bit of cost because when a index adjusts over time, the index fund will also have to buy or sell the underlying holdings to continue its replication. And so there's a cost involved with that. The other cost involved on that side is if I'm the S&P 500, there are so many index funds out there. And if I know that a new company is coming on to the index, then everyone's scrambling to add that holding to their own portfolios, increasing the demand, which might drive the price up. And at least in the short term, there might be some price inefficiencies versus the price that was considered when it was added to the index 
benchmark in the first place. So you're going to have a, a delta of variance depending on how fast or how quickly you can purchase the new holding. And that'll be relative to your competitors. So that can create a net performance differential between you and other index funds. Also, there's sort of a, maybe a diseconomy of scale. If I'm a $10 million fund and I only need to go out and get maybe 50, 100, $200,000 worth of shares for that new company being added to the index, that's not a lot that I need to acquire. If I'm a $10 billion fund, and that asset is now going to make up, you know, 1% of my portfolio, then that's a lot more shares that I have to chase. And the more shares I have to chase, the greater I might drive the price as I buy. So those are issues. And I think the final point on this page we'll talk about is the operating costs. So that's a little bit different from the transaction timing or the tracking error. Now, index funds will have no management fees because no one's doing any active management, but you're still going to have costs associated with the fund in many ways, quite similar to what we saw when we discussed costs on a open-ended mutual fund, you're still going to have the back office, the administrative side, and that'll be accounting for the fund assets, shareholder communication, regulatory filing, staff salaries, rent for the building, utilities, all these things that go into running a bricks and mortar operation. So that's cost. You're still going to have trading costs, whether that's initially replicating in full or in part, or you're going to just have trading costs when a f asset or a new holding comes on an index and one exits. So if I have the Dow Jones, only 30 companies, probably pretty simple to fully replicate. In June of 2018, Walgreens Boots Alliance replaced General Electric effective Tuesday, June 26. So I'm going to incur costs by selling my GE and purchasing Walgreens. And those will be hard costs. And then the timing factor is how many index funds are out there that hold the, that reflect the Dow 30 and they're all scrambling to buy Walgreens and get rid of GE. So there's your costs there. So a passive investor his or her strategy is to match the market return as closely as possible. They have no control over that market return, only really in trying to replicate it as closely as possible. So that's the tracking error, that's their trading costs, that sort of thing. The only thing they can control is their own cost structure. So their goal is to minimize the costs. And when we looked at the active management, that was the downfall of achieving alpha and alpha being the outperformance of the fund versus its benchmark. Fund costs are key to hurting active manager ability to outperform their benchmark. Morningstar came up with some data that matched what we looked at previously. 
24% of all active funds, bonds, international, small cap, every sector, only 24% beat their passive equivalents over 10 years ending June 2020. So over a 10-year period, you only saw consistent outperformance in 24% of the funds. And when we looked at our own data in a prior session, we saw that in the US large cap blended equity sector, say the S&P 500, 32.3% of actively managed funds beat their benchmark. Over 10 years, only 8%. And on the world stage, also with large cap equity, 55.2% exceeded their benchmark in one year, but that fell to 31.8% over 10 years. And I cite that data because it's important to remember that it's on a consistent and longer term basis that it's very difficult for active managers to demonstrate that they can achieve alpha outperform their benchmarks. And a large part of that was the management expense ratios. When we looked at our own data, we saw that with actively managed equity funds, the simple MER was 1.24%. And simple being just add up all the funds, MERs, and divide by the number of funds. The weighted average basis was 0.74. And on a weighted basis, they add up all the MERs, but they're weighted based on the asset size of the specific fund. So the bigger funds you can see obviously have lower expense ratios because of the weighting. Now, if we look at the index funds, again, equity, the simple MER, 0.64%, roughly half of the active. And on a weighted average basis, 0.07%. So again, you're looking at 50 basis points, roughly 45, less on a weighted average basis. If I'm an active manager and I'm trying to exceed my benchmark return, I've got to produce an extra half percent just to match the passive investor. And if you look at, in this case, US equities, historically over time, you know, maybe 8% would be a good return, you know, on average over a longer term period. So if I've got to pick up 0.5 of that, just to break even versus my passive investor, that's a bit of work. We also talked about the timing being a cost, at least in my mind. There's no timing in passive investing. You buy the benchmark and you hold it. Now I'm not talking about changing your asset allocation or you know that sort of thing, building up positions over time or uh, rebalancing as you need to. So I decide on, I want 30% of my portfolio in US equities. And I decide, for whatever reason, the S&P 500 is the best representative of that 30% in U.S. equities. So I just buy the S&P 500 in that percentage to my overall portfolio. And what I'll find over time is, depending on my funding patterns for the other assets, I'm going to have to buy additional units of the S&P 500 to keep that 30% in line. Or maybe the US market has a huge bull run. And if the rest of my 
assets get out of line, I may have to sell some of the S&P 500 and reallocate to the underperforming or underrepresented parts of my asset allocation. So, but here I'm just talking about, okay, we buy the S&P 500. We're not trying to say, oh, I think the markets are going to go up or down and I'm going to adjust my exposure because of that. Now, in the previous session, we saw that if someone takes $10,000 and invests for 38 years from January 1980 to December 2018 were the dates, 13,870 days, they'd accumulate $659,515. But if they miss only five best days, five out of almost 14,000, they only accumulate 426,999. That's down 35%. So they miss five days out of almost 14,000 and their portfolio falls 35%. Miss 30 days, 30 best days, Portfolio only goes to 125,000, down 81%. And if you miss only 50 days out of that 313,870, you only grow your 10,000 to 57,382. That's down 91%. All because you engaged in market timing and that caused you to miss the 50 best days. Now, I'm not saying that you will miss all 50 days. There's a much better chance you'll miss the five best days. And again, my caveat last time was that maybe you will also be able to avoid some of the bad days. But this is just kind of a demonstration that if you stay constantly invested, you're not going to worry about missing out on good or good days in the market simply because you were market timing and got it not quite right. Now this is a Morningstar data and this is an interesting graph because what it tells you is that expenses, fund expenses, and I've mentioned this before, are probably the biggest predictor of future success in a specific investment, in this case, a mutual fund. Now, what Morningstar went and did was they created what they call a success ratio. They took a few different factors to test how the expense ratios worked on a portfolio. They looked at total return over the ensuing period. They looked at load adjusted returns, standard deviation, investor returns, and then the subsequent Morningstar rating. And the success ratio looked at those things and factored in mutual funds that were merged away or liquidated over the ensuing period. So that's the survivorship bias that we talked about. Then they grouped all the cheapest quintile in this case, the bottom 25, 20%, top 20%, and then the second cheapest quintile and, and so on. And they looked at five-year data ending December 2015 in this slide. What they found was that using expense ratios to choose funds helped in every asset class, in every quintile during that 2010 to 2015 period. So if we look here, US equities on the left side, the cheapest quintile had a total return success rate of 62%. And then it was 48%, 39, 30, and 20. And that's consistent across the board, is that 
the cheaper the cost, the higher the probability of success. Now, what's interesting here is in most cases, it's really only the cheapest 20 funds that produce the biggest success ratios. And their conclusions in part was the cost of a fund points investors to a better outcome for investor returns and load adjusted returns. It was a weaker predictor for standard deviation, but that's not a big surprise because fees and volatility are really not linked. If I'm investing in a sector equity, or if there was a small cap fund listed there, chances are there's going to be higher standard deviation than just large cap US equity or blended. So again, fees really differ. The only thing I would say there is that the higher the standard deviation, the riskier the asset which may involve more work. So in that way, there's probably is a bit of a correlation on cost is that you would expect to see higher fees for higher volatility investments. So that's just an interesting way that Morningstar has sort of looked and said, okay, here we quantify it. Yeah, not the longest time period, five years, but here's our proof, at least to us, that low costs are the path to success. And again, that's what I've been kind of harping on, maybe in reverse, that when we looked at active funds, higher costs are a predictor of less success. And that's a big gain for the index funds, which are, as we saw on a weighted average basis, the equity sides, 0.07. And it was the same for bond funds too, and that slide from our last session 0 0.07 so much cheaper with indice index funds and then one area we haven't covered although we did discuss this indirectly when we looked at our investor profiles is that a big thing for passive investors is that you need to invest in accordance with your investor profile. And that's what I said when we looked at target asset allocation is your investor profile, and that's your financial situation, your prospects to come as far as earnings, your financial objectives. And as we talked, you have high, medium, and low priorities, and you have priorities that are by time, short, mid, long. I want to buy a house in three years and I need $100,000 for the down payment. That's a shorter, higher priority versus I want to retire in 45 years. That is also a high priority, but it is a long term. And so your asset allocation has to reflect the timing of those objectives, as well as any constraints, your risk tolerance, your other time horizon factors, all those things. And that creates your target asset allocation. Now, here we are today is that I'm kind of saying that the investments to include to fit that target asset allocation probably should be low cost, open end, no load, mutual funds or exchange traded funds. And we'll get into exchange traded funds in this upcoming episode. So cost in MER is paramount to consider when we're looking at which actual investments to include. And what I call here the net returns that would factor in average tracking error. I probably don't want to invest in a fund that has poor replication or poor tracking er error 
on a consistent basis because that's going to over time erode my net returns versus competitors. And yes, occasionally tracking error can go the other direction too, but we want to strive for consistency, not that volatility that we would see in a risky stock. And again, the trading costs, do they have economies of scale? Is this Vanguard or iShares or Fidelity, which is huge, and I don't really care how much my fund accountant gets paid because I've got billions in my fund versus that becomes an issue if I've only got 50 million in a fund. And then we're not going to get into this with us because I don't think people listening to this probably should be using derivatives to replicate their portfolios, but some investors will actually use derivatives or other financial instruments to create that asset allocation, which is perfectly fine. And the other area that you have to consider is how to allocate your capital. Again, that's your target asset allocation. You want to allocate to meet that financial objectives. If all my allocation is looking at my 45 year old time frame for retirement and not that I would recommend this necessarily but you've put everything into venture capital because you don't need that liquidity and then suddenly oh you know I want to buy that house in one year time my child is going to go to university in three years Oh, sorry, you're in venture capital that's in liquid. We can't get your money out for you. So that's sort of the target asset allocation is that mix of different types of assets, different liquidity issues, and different time horizons for them so that you can meet your financial objectives. And then asset allocation, we discussed this with asset correlations and diversification. It's a prime factor in your overall performance. And we talked about how portfolio return is simply a weighted average of the individual components. If you have four assets, each with 25%, and they all return 10%, your fund average is going to be 10%. It's just simple addition and division. However, when we talked about asset correlations, there's a slightly different impact on the risk of your portfolio by adding unlike assets. And your coefficient that relates to the asset correlation can go from positive 1.0, where the two assets are perfectly correlated, down to negative 1.0, where they're inversely correlated. And you can go back and listen to those podcasts if you can't remember the discussion but the idea here is that unless something's perfectly correlated it will work when you combine with another asset to reduce the overall portfolio standard deviation which is its risk so in our example where let's say now we only have two assets and they both are expected to return 10 percent then your portfolio should also expect to return 10% because it's just weighted average. But if the two assets were perfectly correlated, 1.0, and their risk was 15%, then the standard deviation for the portfolio would also be 15%. But if the correlation was perhaps 0.7, maybe the risk for the portfolio falls to 13%. If the correlation is zero, maybe the risk of the portfolio falls to 9%. If the risk of the portfolio uh, are the two assets, the correlation is negative one, maybe the portfolio risk as a whole falls to 7%. So by introducing non-perfectly correlated assets together, 
you can reduce your portfolio risk and maintain the return. Now, the one thing I want to point out here is you often see that allocation explains 90% or 95% of an in portfolio's performance or return. And it was interesting because I read something where 49 out of 50 studies that someone looked at found that they got that wrong. And it's the 90 or the 95% figure relates to variability of returns, not the returns themselves. So 90% of the returns in your portfolio aren't due to your asset allocation, but the variability of the returns. So I just wanted to point that out because you can see that uh, often incorrectly. And that was Jennifer Nuttall and John Nuttall that found that 49 out of 50 survey citations of the original survey that found that 90% uh, reported it inaccurately. And again, you're going to ask, what's the variability of returns versus actual returns? And again, variability is a concept of the risk. And that's what we just sort of discussed with the asset correlations. It's how you bring a portfolio together. But it's a little bit different conversation to look at returns. And your return tends to be, yes, asset allocation important, but less so it's not 90% of the returns are due to the asset allocation. Okay, that's all for this. Uh, a good look at sort of the concept behind passive investing and kind of reinforcing why so many people are making that shift to invest passively and invest in index funds. And we saw that again in previous episodes where big shift of assets, investor assets are going into index funds because people are understanding that low cost is the way to go, that you tend not to see outperformance by active managers. So why pay for that? And sticking to your asset allocation, figuring out how do I meet my financial objectives, which is my investor profile and creating a target asset allocation that meets those goals. Thanks for your time today. Have yourself a good one.